Okay, whatever. 905 over there and almost 910 over there. You take your take your pick. Um, fortunately, government, government's been more synchronized than these clocks lately, which is something I uh, appreciate in terms of uh, some of our coming uh, speakers. Um, many of you have seen the drought workshop agenda, uh, uh, and I thank you all for coming, and I thank the people who are listening on the web. Just a couple of announcements when we start. Um, in this building, if you hear a loud noise that sounds like an emergency sound, it probably is. Uh, our assembly point is out in Cesar Chavez Park. If you want to know when the all clear uh, gets uh, called, uh, go meet us out there. Uh, staff are supposed to go out and meet us out there. Um, with me today for this workshop are to my far left, board member Dee Dee Diadamo, to her right, Vice Chair Fran Spivey Weber, to my right, board member Tam Dodak today. Um, board member Steve Moore could not be with us today. Um, as you know, this is not a regular board meeting, a formal board meeting of the state board. It is a workshop. Um, the purpose of the workshop is to get your input um, and best ideas, your concerns, hopes, fears, advice um, on how to carry out our responsibilities to act in the public interest uh, in this drought. Uh, these first two days will be focused primarily on uh, Executive Director Tom Howard's temporary urgency change order. Um, in terms of what's in the public interest, you'll hear a description of what that is a little bit later, uh, as well as the curtailment notices, uh, the notice of a notice of curtailment that went out and the curtailment notices that are likely to go out shortly as a result of our um, uh, our uh, responsibility to implement the water rights uh, system of California as laid out in statute and case law. Um, so we really want your feedback on that. Uh, we will have a series of opening panels to set the stage, uh, and then we will open it up to public comment. My understanding is that some of you would like to arrange yourself in panels. That ends up being good for comprehension uh, of uh, the audience and comprehensiveness uh, and focus in your comments. Uh, I'll ask you to work with um, Karen, with uh, Janine Townsend and you on that. But I will say, depending on the number that we get, sometimes when we organize folks into panels, it can take until late in the afternoon for the general public to speak. And so what we've decided to do is we will intersperse any of those uh, publicly organized panels with individual speakers who turn in blue cards. So if you wish to speak, uh, please turn in a blue card. The other thing I will note is that since we're being webcast, it's important that you try and speak directly into the microphone. Um, and also, if you'll take any of your devices that make noise, please uh, turn them off or set them on stun for the um, remainder of the meeting. Uh, from a housekeeping and logistics standpoint, we will take a half hour break uh, at some point between, um, probably between uh, 10 and 10.30. I can't say exactly when we try and get through as many of the panels as we can. Uh, that will allow folks a little bit of time to organize their public comment panels if they'd like to do that, as well as to take uh, bio breaks and coffee breaks and whatever else you need. Um, my inclination, depending on the number of speaker cards we get, is to take a relatively short lunch break. Um, I think a half hour is a little short for people, an hour maybe more than needed, so I'm going to aim at a 45-minute break, uh, perhaps closer to 1 o'clock, and I hope that works for people. If it's a hardship, uh, please let uh, Ms. Turgovich or um, Janine Townsend know. Um, first, Mr. Howard, will you introduce your staff? who are assisting today? Uh, assisting the board today are Janine Townsend and Courtney Davis. To my left, Chief Counsel Michael Laufer, and to my right, Chief Deputies Karen Turgovich and John Bishop. And we have some staff up front who will be doing a presentation in a few minutes. Terrific. Um, thank you. We're going to be doing, uh, just so you have a sense of what our opening panels um, will be like, um, once uh, I finish and my board members say anything they'd like to say before we start. Uh, we'll first have opening remarks by Gordon Burns, Undersecretary for Cal EPA, and Janelle Bieland, Undersecretary for the California Natural Resources Agency. We really appreciate you being here. More than that, we 
really appreciate the leadership that you've both shown in this crisis and before through the Water Action Plan. And like we're both, both agencies are incredibly fortunate to have you too and appreciate having you here even though I can barely see you over my monitor. Um, next we'll have the State Water Board staff introduction, the staff panel. Uh, then uh, DWR and the Bureau, the operations um, uh, agencies will talk about uh, statewide hydrologic conditions, but also the temporary urgency change petition and transfers. Then we'll have a panel of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, talk about those same issues, uh, and then the real-time drought operations team. So I'm looking at Bill. Um, so uh, we'll look forward to that. It should be an informative uh, introductory part of the morning, and then we will hear from you. The, the one thing I will say, you saw in the notice quite a few questions that we asked, and I just want to emphasize that we are really interested in what you all think. Uh, this is a challenging time. It is a time when the community of California is facing a challenge of massive uh, proportions um, and one in which the impacts vary widely across the state. And it's a time for us to all pull together. It is also a time for a variety of judgment calls um, on our part as we look towards the rest of this season uh, and perhaps the seasons beyond. Um, so we really do want your thinking. Part of the, the point of this workshop, part of the point of the existence of this board is to be a vehicle for public uh, expert stakeholder and general public impact on the important water policy issues of the day and of our time, um, and we're at a, obviously at a crucial point in that. So we really welcome all of your thoughts and your input. Uh, we will not be making any formal decisions today. This is not a formally noticed hearing on a specific issue. We will really be here all ears um, to listen to you. We may give individual feedback as individuals uh, to our staff, um, and we may decide uh, later to hold a formal hearing on some of these issues. That's uh, another question for you all, but uh, we understand the gravity of the, uh, of the situation and the need for us all as Californians to collaborate as never before to get through what is perhaps the most challenging issue that's faced any of us in our professional lives. So um, with that, I want to turn to my colleagues and see if they have any opening comments before we begin. Um, the only thing I would say is just I really appreciate all of the collaboration that's been going on, uh, uh, not just with uh, our staff, but uh, the various um, uh, agencies of the state, the governor's office, the federal agencies, and all of the stakeholders, and look forward to listening and uh, learning today. Thanks. Thank you. There we go. So with that, let's get on to it. Um, I'll turn now to Gordon and Janelle. Thank you so much for being here. I think we decided I was going to go first Great. here. <laughs> um, well, as Gordon will highlight in more detail, on January 17th, Governor Brown issued an emergency proclamation of drought in response to what is projected to be the driest year on record in California. That proclamation ordered that our Department of Water Resources work constructively with fellow state and federal agencies to take proactive steps now that can preserve our ability to manage water supplies across a broad array of needs should the drought worsen. Simply put, there's very little water in the state's rivers and reservoirs at this point in time. Our most recent snowpack survey after the early February storm showed snowpack is at 27 percent of normal. Reservoir levels across the state are lower than during the droughts in 1977 and 1924. The small amount of rain and snow that have fallen in Northern California since the drought declaration is less than a drop in the bucket. Considering that we're two-thirds through the wet season, this state could have to experience heavy rainfall and snowfall every other day until May to near average pre precipitation totals, and even then, we would still be in a drought due to the recent dry years of the last couple of years that we've had. Um, right now, many communities are running out of drinking water, as you all are aware. Many of California's rivers and streams, which provide essential habitat for endangered and, in th and threatened species, are also running very low. And farmers that rely on surface water for irrigation are faced with difficult decisions to plant crops amid great uncertainty whether state and federal water infrastructure will be 
able to deliver any of the water that they need to supplement local supplies to grow their crops. Everyone who relies in whole or in part on project water, farmers, fish, people in cities and towns, will get less water this year. Simply put, there's not enough water to go around, so we need to conserve and make some strategic decisions now, planning for the worst, if we do not get much more precipitation in the next couple of months. These decisions are being made in a way that provides for the highest degree of flexibility possible to allow us to adapt when and if conditions change. The situation is very dynamic, and our agencies and departments at both the state and federal level are rising to the challenge. One of the most important lessons from our previous record dry years, such as 76 and 77, is that delay exasperates the, exasper exacerbates <laughs> the effects of the drought. Just like the governor has asked all Californians to conserve water around their homes, we're taking the same action for the state on a much larger scale. That means making sure that the state maintains its ability to protect water quality so that Californians who rely in whole or in part on the Delta have adequate clean drinking water. In addition to recognizing the uh, extraordinary efforts of the state and federal agencies that work to prepare and submit the temporary urgency change per per petition, I want to thank the staff of the State Water Board for taking quick action on that petition to allow us to slow down the release of the little water we have stored. Otherwise, regulations would require us to release that water now. The amount usually re required to be released from res reservoirs at this time of the year was set assuming a dry year, but not a drought of this magnitude. The slower release will meet basic standards to keep salt water from the San Francisco Bay from overtaking our freshwater delta, which is the main hub of the state's water supply. Keeping salt water out makes sure we can keep delivering a minimum amount of water to people, allows some fish to migrate, and saves our precious storage for later in the year for families, farmers, and fish. Failing to take action could result in our reservoirs running out of water later in the year, which means no available water flow to prevent saltwater intrusion in the delta. That would jeopardize water supplies for users both in the delta and south of the delta and potentially cause major environmental impacts. In addition to the substantial coordination at the technical level among our departments and agencies and federal water and biological agencies to present the information you will hear today, there continues to be close co coordination on the ground in support of the many actions, both current and future, that you will be hearing and discussing. We are also working daily to balance needs and interests throughout the state on the overall long-term sustainability of our water resources. This is not just about the current problem of this serious drought. This administration continues to be engaged with a broader perspective, which was most re recently reflected in the release of the California Water Action Plan. The Water Action Plan over the next five years will guide state efforts to enhance water supply reliability, restore damaged and destroyed ecosystems, and improve the resilience of our infrastructure overall. We're off to a great start. The governor's 2014-15 budget proposes 618.7 million in funding priorities for the Water Action Plan and would lay a solid fiscal foundation for implementing important near-term actions. This includes funding for water efficiency projects, wetland and watershed restoration, groundwater programs, conservation, flood control, and integrated water management. And we'll be looking to you and everyone here today at the workshop to help support us in the effort to get the, this through the budget and through the legislative process in order to, for us to continue to be able to implement the Water Action Plan. We encourage you to continue your engagement beyond your participation at this forum, and we look forward to working with you as we implement the Water Action Plan as a, and as we pursue the goals of a reliable supply, ecosystem restoration, and resilient water infrastructure. And as dry conditions persist, we're going around and reminding everyone to please help us promote water conservation as a way of life by visiting the Save Our Water website, which is saveourh2o.org. And um, just thank you for having me here today and everyone here at the workshop for their participation. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Your Secretary Burns. Thank you and good morning. I'll keep my comments brief. Um, I'd like to provide a little bit of context, um, just a quick overview of the administration's efforts on drought. 
Uh, as, um, as Janelle mentioned, the governor uh, issued his drought declaration a year or a month ago yesterday. Um, s since then, the state has launched the statewide conservation campaign, Save Our H2O. It's, uh, the agencies have expedited water transfers, something actually that the governor had called for prior to, uh, to the January 17 declaration. Um, the uh, Bureau and DWR filed its petition to adjust flows and, uh, and operate the cross-channel gates, which we're discussing today. Uh, the gates are operating now. The flow requirements are lower. Um, there's an export limit as part of that order, of course. And, um, and I think uh, Executive Director Howard uh, displayed some nimbleness and flexibility when he amended the order to, um, to allow for conditions when we briefly had that um, that nice rain that um, that brought the flows up in the delta to normal levels, and the order was amended to allow normal exports under those circumstances as well. Um, we received last week, or the board received last week, a petition to consolidate places of use in the state and federal projects. Uh, the Department of Public Health has been helping communities that are running low on water and doing a very good job with that. Um, the Department of Food and Agriculture has launched a website to connect farmers and farm workers to state and federal assistance programs. The um, State Water Board, of course, uh, uh, has um, uh, issued notices of curtailments um, to enforce the water right seniority system when there's not enough water. The um, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife has closed rivers to sport fishing. Um, there's been, in general, good coordination with the federal government um, there have been emergency declarations by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Small Business Administration in, I think, 57 counties or close to it. They've identified funding programs for farmers and water districts and farm workers. And uh, the agencies are working with FERC to conserve water and hydro reservoirs. The uh, administration has formed a drought task force coordinated by the Office of Emergency Services that meets weekly and operates continuously. CAL FIRE has added more than 100 firefighters. I wanted to note that uh, in January, we've had more than 400 fires, whereas uh, last year in January, we had none. It's going to be a busy fire season. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a partial list, and we're working to improve it continuously. Uh, it might be useful to briefly compare the situation uh, that we're in today to 1977, um, as Janelle uh, explain that hydrologically um, we were actually were actually worse off than we were in 1977. In January, at the time that the governor issued his drought declaration, the snowpack was only at 12 percent. In 1977, at that same time, it was at 25 percent. 1977, of course, followed a dry year, um, but it was uh, it was a moderately dry year. Um, we, of course, right now are on the heels of two dry years in 2013 was the driest year in the record books. Uh, in 77, the Water Board issued notices of curtailments beginning in March, and there were five rounds of curtailments that year. It also uh, adjusted the Delta standards um, in February and again in June. There were some problems. Uh, I don't quite understand the details of it, but apparently the state and federal projects weren't operating to the same standards, and the, it fell to the state project to meet the salinity standards in 77, which caused some difficulty. <coughs> there were, I saw the figure, 28,000 drill wells drilled, deepened, or repaired in the period 1976 to 77 by an estimate um, from DWR to the governor. Uh, following the drought. That strikes me as a remarkable number. But folks pulled together. There was an excellent uh, conservation campaign. I was living in Los Angeles, I remember, um, and, uh, and shared resources. And uh, fortunately, 1978 was wet. It was uh, hydrologically 155 percent of uh, average precipitation statewide, um, compared to only uh, 45 percent in 76 and 77. So really, in, uh, in 78, the state dodged a bullet. Had it been dry, the circumstances would have been especially dire. Among the lessons uh, that were drawn from this in, uh, in some retrospective reports following the drought in 77 were um, to start early, to be aggressive, and to, to try to work together and coordinate as much as possible. So 
given our circumstances today, um, we're looking forward to hearing folks' thoughts on uh, the public interest in the petition and, and the curtailments and, uh, and how we're doing. It's a, it's a very difficult circumstance, as it was in 77. You don't know whether next year will be, drought, will be dry or not. Uh, these are, as, uh, as Chairman Marcus um, said, judgment calls. We're operating with imperfect information now and a very uncertain future. We can hope that it's wet like it was in 78 next year. We can hope this season turns around. But in case it doesn't, um, we have to uh, try to act as responsibly as possible. I want to commend the board for, um, for being very conscientious, for coordinating with the other agencies very well. Its staff has put in long hours. Uh, Executive Director Howard is, has, uh, has been very uh, responsive and, and quick in his decision making. And uh, I'm looking forward to the input from the public. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. I know you have a lot on your plates, and we appreciate you opening this workshop for us. Thanks. One thing I didn't say in introducing the workshop is th this is not, these two days are not the only workshops we're having. We are going to be having a workshop on the 26th as well. That one will focus on other drought response issues from conservation to technology to recycling, et cetera. It's a more open uh, forum about uh, the ways in which uh, the State Board can help us get through this drought as opposed to the focus today and tomorrow, which is more on the issues of water rights and the exercise of discretion um, with respect to our Delta and other standard setting processes. So um, with that, thank you both very, very much. <coughs> now we'll move to the State Water Board staff panel uh, with a whole host of things to talk about, the change petition and order curtailments, other requests for transfers and change petitions, as well as the work you've been doing with so I'll let, Les, are you going to introduce the staff panel or? Yes, at least in part. Terrific. And I'll tell my um, colleagues that your monitors uh, apparently are not working, so I think we can manage to turn around or look at the copies of the PowerPoints. So good morning. Uh, my name is Les Grober. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Water Rights. We're going to be presenting as a panel today, so you get to see some of the people that have been directing staff and working on a number of these uh, drought issues. Um, I'll let the people speaking, will introduce themselves. We're also joined at the uh, staff table by Dana Heinrich, and uh, we'll have, we have Brian Coates, a senior water, water resources control engineer in the enforcement unit, John O'Hagan, a supervising water resource control engineer in the enforcement unit, and Kathy Mroka in permitting. And I'll, as I said, I'll let the speakers introduce themselves. Um, yes. So there's been reference already to the governor's uh, proclamation. So I'm just going to identify a couple of the things called out in that proclamation because that's very much it, the the topics that we'll be discussing today. Uh, the proclamation called out the need to expedite transfers, including this thing called the Consolidated Place of Use for the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project. Um, also to put water right holders on notice throughout the state. Also we've been making reference to that. Basically how do we smartly use the limited supply of water that we have this year. And, and then finally also to modify requirements including in the Bay Delta Plan and in D1641 to conserve water, to basically make sure that we keep water further upstream so that we can use it for a variety of things later in the year. <coughs> the proclamation also included a number of exemptions from uh, the Public Resources Code, the Water Code, uh, that allowed us to do these things. So the topics for today, and we're going to have uh, um, uh, three other presenters on that, are the temporary urgency change petition, and that's probably a, a key one because we've already acted, as Gord Gordon had said earlier, on that and have made modifications already to that. Uh, and then again, it was to use water smartly to make sure that we don't release water we don't need to if we don't have to. Uh, then curtailments, and that's going to be for statewide, but again with some you know discussion of, of the different basins. Finally, there's other things going on statewide, other temporary urgency changes, if you will, and transfers. Where do we need an off-ramp from conditions uh, throughout the state, again, to save water? And then finally, we have 
FERC uh, hydropower projects statewide up and down the state where there's the standard conditions for a dry year, but this is not a standard year. So what changes do we make with regard to those things and our interactions with the governor's office and things like that? So that's going to be the, the four major topics uh, that we're going to be covering. And with that, I will hand it off to um, Karen Nia. She's a senior water resources control engineer, and she'll talk about the temporary urgency change petition. Thank you, Les. So today, oh, let me change the slide. Today I will be talking about the, pr or providing an overview of the temporary urgency change petition submitted by Reclamation and DWR to modify water right conditions of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project pursuant to State Water Board Decision 1641 in response to prolonged drought conditions. Decision 1641 requires Reclamation and DWR to implement specified water quality and flow objectives included in the water quality control plan for the Bay Delta. On January 29th, Reclamation and DWR submitted the TUCP requesting tem temporary modification of Decision 1641 at water right terms and conditions that require implementation of Delta outflow and Delta cross-channel gate closure objectives. The petition requests that Delta outflows and Delta exports be managed for health and safety purposes. The petition indicates that approximately 3,000 to 4,500 CFS of Delta outflow is needed to prevent intrusion of seawater into the interior Delta. The petition also indicates that diversions of 1,500 CFS are needed from Delta pumping facilities for health and safety purposes, but that this number may be refined. The petition also requests the ability to further modify these and other requirements of Decision 1641 as needed. The petition states that the changes are needed to preserve storage and upstream reservoirs for fisheries protection and health and safety purposes, including prevention of seawater intrusion. In response to the unprecedented dry conditions, the State Water Board conditionally approved the TUCP on January 31st. In response to a storm event that temporarily allowed reclama Reclamation and DWR to meet the Decision 1641 requirements, the State Water Board modified the TUCP order on February 7th to clarify requirements for high precipitation periods. <coughs> Pursuant to Decision 1641, Delta outflows without the TUCP in February were required to be 7,100 CFS. The TUCP order temporarily modifies the February Delta outflow requirements, allowing outflows to be maintained at no less than 3,000 CFS, along with potential pulse flow requirements. While the petition did not specify a requested Delta outflow, the order finds that some minimal outflow levels should be required to provide some protection of fish and wildlife and other in-stream uses without causing significant impacts to upstream reservoir storage levels. Staff is interested in receiving input today on appropriate Delta outflow levels pursuant to the TUCP order. Pursuant to Decision 1641, the Delta cross-channel gates are required to be closed from February through, Mar through May 20th to reduce the amount of flow needed to improve water quality in the interior Delta and to allow this water to be preserved in upstream storage. The order temporarily allows the Delta cross-channel gates to be operated flexibly in coordination with the State Water Board and Fishery Agencies through the real-time drought operations management team required by the order. The order also limits export pumping by the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project in the Delta to 1,500 CFS or public health and safety pumping levels if Decision 1641 terms and conditions cannot be met. Water transfers are not included in this limitation. Export pumping levels that are needed for health and safety are being refined by DWR and Reclamation. Last Friday, they submitted a summary report that stated that the 1,500 CFS level is a reasonable maximum health and safety level and that they are continuing to develop a minimum health and safety export level. If enough precipitation occurs that allows DWR and Reclamation to meet Decision 1641 terms and conditions, the order allows for export pumping to exceed 1,500 CFS but only if that amount over 1,500 CFS is from natural or abandoned flows or transfers. This condition will help to preserve storage in upstream reservoirs for use later in the year. As mentioned previously, the order establishes a real-time drought operations management team 
to coordinate real-time operational decisions. And you will hear a presentation from this group later this morning. The order also requires that water conserved pursuant to the order be stored for critical needs later in the year as determined by the real-time drought operations management team. The order also requires DWR and reclamation to maintain an updated water balance, identifying available and projected supplies and uses throughout the year in order to inform decisions of the real-time drought operations team. The order also requires that DWR and reclamation conduct modeling and monitoring to inform future decisions. The real-time drought mo operations management team established by this order is comprised of staff from the State Water Board, DWR, Reclamation, CDFW, NIMS, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. As indicated earlier, there will be a presentation from the team later this morning. Pursuant to the Water Code, objections to the TSCP order will be accepted until March 3rd. Depending on the nature of the objections, an evidentiary hearing may be held. During the duration of the order, staff will continue to coordinate with Reclamation, DWR, and the fishery agencies through the real-time drought operations management team and will continue to participate in discussions and consider input from others. Additional modifications to the order may be considered if new information is received or if circumstances change. If any additional temporary modifications are made, public notice and opportunity to comment or object will be provided. This concludes the discussion of the TUCP order for the Central Valley and State Water Projects. And if there aren't any questions, I will hand the presentation to Jim Castle, who will be covering the potential curtailment notices. Thank you, Karen. Um, I am Jim Castle. I'm Assistant Deputy Director for Water Rights in charge of permitting and enforcement. And I will talk about the uh, curtailment notices. Uh, to date, let me change the slide. To date, the State Water Board has issued uh, a potential curtailment notice and no actual curtailment notices. The notice was sent on January 17th, immediately following the Governor's drought proclamation to water diverters statewide. It informed diverters that the State Water Board could issue water curtailment notices to diverters in critically dry watersheds according to water right priority and that they should be looking for alternate water supplies if they are in a water short area. Appropriative water rights have a first in time priority, so junior appropriative water right holders must cease diverting until senior water rights are fully satisfied. Riparian right holders are senior to appropriate right diverters, but can only divert water that is naturally occurring in a service stream. The notice um, also provided links to water conservation information. All right, next I wanted to briefly uh, discuss the factors we are considering in prioritizing watersheds for curtailment. The first is obvious, uh, the forecasted water supply will not meet the estimated demand. The most critically dry watersheds should be addressed first. We are also looking at watersheds where there are communities who expect to run out of water. It is prudent to curtail diversions as soon as possible in those watersheds so that the dwindling supply of water can be, be preserved. And finally, those watersheds with critical public trust resource, resources, such as endangered species, should be considered. And this is the last slide. I'd like to give a brief understanding of the data and analysis we are using to make our curtailment decisions. This graph shows water supply and water demand curves for an example watershed presented in acre feet of water per month. The dashed lines are the forecasted water supply that uh, we get this information from the Department of Water Resources. And these lines in, uh, for this example show a 90% and a 50% exceedance value. So if we use a 50% exceedance value, this means that in 100 years, 50 years should have a water supply that is greater than the projected supply, and 50 years will be less. This data is updated monthly by the department for major watersheds in California, and uh, we've been working with the department. We think we can get this uh, forecast of supply on a weekly um, basis to help us with our curtailment decisions. The remaining three solid curves are water demand estimates based on reported water use by diverters 
to the State Water Board's water rights data management system. If the dashed line is above a water demand curve, there should be water available for these diverters. If the dashed line is below a water demand curve, then the diverters should be curtailed. In this example, the red line is the water demand in this example watershed by those water diverters claiming a riparian or pre-1914 appropriative water right. These diverters are required to file statements of water di diversion and use. The current reporting requirement for statements, however, is once every three years for monthly diversion data, and it's reported by July 1st of the calendar year following the three-year period. So therefore, the best complete set of water diversion data we have for statements is for the year 2010. Using the 50% exceedance value supply in this example, so the, the uh, higher dash line, there should be water available for statement holders until the end of May, where the red line crosses and exceeds the dark blue dash line. That looks like a purple line in this uh, chart. The two upper lines are where we add the water use diversion data for post-1914 appropriative water right holders to the water use information from our statement holders. These diverters have a water right permit or license administered by the State Water Board. Uh, these diverters are required to report their monthly diversion data on an annual basis. And again, that data is due by July 1st of the calendar year following the, the reporting period. Since the priority of these water rights are first in time, first in right, we can evaluate this data by year to determine at which date priority we should curtail the water diversion. In this example, the most senior water right um, happened to be one filed in 1919, and that water use curve falls completely above the blue, the, uh, or above both, both dash lines. Therefore, all of the post-1914 appropriators in this watershed should be curtailed at this time. It is important to note that this example does not include a base amount of water for public trust resources. If we include an amount of water for fish and wildlife and give it a priority, then the water demand curves in this example will raise by the amount of water set aside for these public trust uses, and the result could be an earlier water curtailment date for water right holders. Um, at this time, we are focusing our curtailment analyses on the San Joaquin watershed, the Sacramento, the Russian, the Eel, and the Tulare Lake uh, Basin watersheds. So unless you have any questions for me at this time, I'll pass my presentation to Amanda Montgomery, the Chief of our Water Rights Permitting and Water Transfer Activities. Thanks, Jim. Maybe I'm, I have a few questions. Sure. So the, um, I think I understand red is riparian and pre-1914? That's correct. Okay, and then sort of purple is post? The, uh, the solid lines above the red line are our post-1914 um, um, water demand charts. So the dashed lines are what the forecasted water supply will be. The solid line is a, uh, I'm looking at the, um, wh where it says 1919 demand. Right. And 1939 demand. That's correct. Those are um, post-1914 appropriate water right demands that we, uh, of water use that we have in our, our water right system. Okay, so, and, what, and, and what's the cutoff point between the two? It's this 1919, 1939? Well, what you would have here is, um, between the red line, which are for our pre-1914 and um, riparian demands, uh, between the red line and the 1919 demand line, mm -hmm. those would be um, any water right holders from uh, 1914 to 1919. Mm, okay. Between the, the curve 1919 and 1939, those would be any water right diverters with a priority between 1919 and 1939. Okay. And then, um, uh, a couple of questions about the notice that's already been sent out. I've seen the notice, mm -hmm. but I haven't looked to any of the links. So just um, uh, questions here focusing on providing information to the public. Right. So I understand that this is just an example of a watershed, right. but it, it's pretty troubling. Yes. And um, just wondering, um, after you've walked us through this, it, it makes sense, but for the average person out there that got one of these notices, if they happen to be in a watershed that looks this bad, 
um, what type of information has been provided or could be provided you know, on a chart or some way to kind of let them know how serious the situation is in terms of the numbers? Um, well, what we intend to provide with our notices, our actual curtailment notice, is um, a link to our uh, water rights drought site which uh, has a lot of information about the seriousness of, of the drought and has links to other, uh, like the Department of Water Resources, the Save Our Water site, and, and other information regarding the drought. Um, we also um, provide a, uh, we'll provide a phone number that they can call and, and ask questions and we would get back to them on, on those questions. Um, as far as, um, that's all that comes to mind at the moment. How about watershed by watershed though? So if I'm on the, on the eel, uh, one, the, the priorities you mentioned, Eel, Sacramento, Tulare. Uh, right. So if I'm in any of those watersheds, would there be a link that I could pull up for my watershed to get information, maybe not as detailed as this, because you know this requires someone to actually walk you through it, right. but something that um, would give a person in that watershed a better sense of uh, the severity of the situation in terms of the numbers. Yeah, at this time, um, we had not planned to provide uh, additional information to that extent. Uh, we were just going to say, send out our notice saying that um, there is not water available for their diversion at this time and that they should continue to look at the link that we are providing to them with the notice to see if that particular curtailment is lifted. Please, Barbara. Hello, Barbara Hi. Evoy, Division of Water Rights. Um, as Jim said, uh, we have these in development for several watersheds, and our plan had been to, um, a after we've heard comments today as to the curtailment process, uh, if we have a, a clear idea then of how we'd like to move ahead, if there are any changes we need to make, to, to be able to incorporate those comments, but then to post something like this for the different watersheds. So as we move through the year and we get actual mm -hmm. data on supply, uh, and actu our actual data on demand, uh, we'll be able to put these up with clearer forecasts as we move through, but to allow people to see where they fall in this whole process. Terrific, okay. And then the last question on, right. you said that it doesn't include baseline, uh, or base, any base allocation for pu public trust. That's correct. Um, resources, uh, what are you thinking of in terms of how do you evaluate that um, in areas where uh, there aren't any uh, regulatory requirements currently? Right. I, I think that really depends upon the watershed and, of course, the uh, public trust values that are present in that watershed. We are, we have been um, discussing these issues and continued. We have some uh, um, other meetings that are already scheduled to talk with the fisheries agencies on the best way to go about um, providing that type of supply for public trust resources. We're certainly open to any information that the public can provide us today to hear about the best way to do that. Um, Again, I think it, it really does depend upon the watershed and the critical needs of the communities, and we have to balance that against the, the public trust resources. If I may add, on the San Joaquin and Sacramento River, we have the information developed for the outflow for the delta that uh, is, is necessary for um, baseline. And so we're incorporating uh, the delta, delta outflow numbers into those examples or into those curtailments. And so for those, we do have a baseline, at least of outflow. On the others, as Jim said, we have a lot of information on ESA segments in various watersheds, on what would be needed there. We also have the information coming to us on distressed communities that we'll need to be able to incorporate if we are able to um, contribute to a solution for some of those distressed communities. So the only thing I would say there is just uh, recognizing the urgency and what's already in the governor's uh, proclamation, which you know provides for uh, and requires us to move quickly. But um, any additional information that you can provide on uh, process once you further evaluate that um, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And that is one thing we'd very much like to hear from uh, the public. agencies today. And as Jim said, we have a meeting scheduled this Friday with uh, the fish uh, resource agencies to particularly hear their ideas on how they might proceed and perhaps it will be informed by today's and tomorrow's workshop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Member Diadamo, this is uh, Karen Trick. Point out that um, if the website that Jim Castle mentioned 
also contains a fact sheet on curtailment itself. So anyone interested in understanding the water rights priority process, understand the type of right that they have and how it fits into the curtailment analysis, can go to that fact sheet on our website. All of these notices are posted there as well, and any subsequent notices will be posted there to it. Great. I, my, I, I suspect that those with water rights will understand this better than the public that surrounds them. So just to make sure that it's written in a way that the public can understand uh, without having to hire a water rights lawyer would be great. No disrespect intended to many of you anyway. Okay. Any other? Thank you. Next. So, uh, so again, I'm Amanda Montgomery, and I'm the program manager for water rights permitting and licensing. And in addition to the earlier presentation on the urgency change for the Bay Delta standards, we've been receiving requests from right holders to modify their permits and licenses. Most of these, urgency, most of these are urgency requests, but a few are long-term change petitions. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> uh, a few of these are long-term change petitions as parties encounter um, challenges during any dry period. The changes needed vary by right holder. Some request relief from fish bypass requirements, which would allow the right holder to divert more water or to keep more water in storage. Another request is to add a point of rediversion to help them better manage their existing storage. Quick action on these requests is of our highest priority. We track the requests we receive on our drought webpage. We expect many more urgency requests as the drought conditions continue. Next, I'll discuss one urgency change that we acted upon in December, which was ahead of the drought proclamation. On December 20th, we received an urgency change petition from Sonoma County Water Agency to modify their water rights permit. The change was approved 11 days later. Their urgency need was due to severely low rainfall in the area and resulting low storage levels in Lake Mendocino. They asked to modify the methodology for determination of water supply conditions for the upper Russian River watershed, which are established by decision 1610. The change did not affect the lower Russian River watershed. Lake Sonoma in the lower River, Russian River watershed has several years of carryover storage. The modified hydraulic index based on Lake Mendocino storage level levels, was requested in lieu of a hydraulic index based on cumulative Lake Pillsbury Eel River inflow. That's the current hydrologic index. Without the change, the current index would require releases of water from Lake Mendocino at levels that would risk significant depletions of storage and potential elimination of water supplies for the Mendocino County and Upper Sonoma County water users. It would also cause um, impacts to water supplies needed for fisheries protection. Next, I'm going to discuss water transfers. We're ramping up our activities on these earlier this year than in a typical year when we wouldn't get started until April. Water transfers allow exchanges from a right holder to another user. Transfers enable water to flow where it's needed most. The available water to transfer can come from previously stored water, from cropland idling or shifting, and also from groundwater substitution. Hmm. Short-term water transfers are for one year or less. They can involve water moving within a given watershed, such as the San Joaquin Valley. It can also involve water transferred north to south, such as through the delta pumps. You may be wondering if transfers can happen through the Delta this year, based on what we've heard on the urgency change for Delta standards. We want to make smart decisions on how we move forward with our limited water resources this year. And if transfers are part of that solution, then that is something that's possible in the Delta. Depending, um, so one thing to point out about transfers is that depending on the type of transfer that's involved, it's not just here, us here at the board who are involved in that decision making. It's also the Department of Water Resources and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. And starting on the day that the drought proclamation went into effect, we began holding joint meetings with those other two agencies to talk about how to expedite transfers. That's something that was called for in um, the executive order B-2113, 
and was reiterated in the governor's drought proclamation. We have also met with state and federal fisheries agencies to begin to solicit their input on the transfer process. So far, we have received two short-term water transfers to date. We post transfer petitions as soon as we receive them on our drought webpage. One of the requests that we have received is to consolidate the place of use between the Department of Water Resources and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation south of Delta. We received a similar request in 2009 and again last year. This change would impact one Department of Water Resources water right and 21 reclamation water rights. <laughs> if requested, uh, if granted this request, it will help to alleviate the water shortage for DWR and reclamation users south of Delta. We publicly noticed this request last Friday, and if we get no comments, we anticipate issuing an order by the end of March. If there's no questions, I conclude my presentation and hand it back to Les. Great, thank you very much. Nice to see you. Yeah, get a little closer. Yeah. Uh, finally, another area that, uh, that I mentioned at the start, um, how, how do we best operate some of our hydropower projects statewide? And the FERC license project that operate under uh, FERC license and also under our water quality certifications. Um, the Commission is responsible for issuing licenses for non-federal hydropower projects, and these price projects are licensed generally for 30 to 50 years. Um, under the Clean Water Act, we're responsible for issuing water quality certifications and have conditions to ensure compliance with standards, uh, including uh, uh, water quality, but also flow requirements. Um, both the FERC license and our water quality certification um, are a condition of the license, and they have flow requirements that are generally based on the, the standard hydrologic conditions and the standard drought, but this is the standard drought again. So um, we've been involved in this area also in making modifications. Um, we, uh, um, we're reviewing requests that we're receiving for changes to certification requirements, including a request that we've gotten from PG&E related to uh, relief reservoir on the, uh, in the Spring Gap Stanislaw project. Um, we're also consulting with uh, licensees interested in ch potentially changing flow requirements, and that includes El Dorado Irrigation District. Uh, we've been co coordinating with FERC and also the Department of Water Resources. And uh, finally, uh, we've also been uh, um, co coordinating on the issuance of a letter to the California Hydropower Licensees that recognizes that the drought and the FERC's ability to work with the licensees to make temporary or longer uh, term changes to the license requirements in response to the drought. Um, FERC's letter requested that licensees consult with the appropriate agencies in advance of making uh, any changes. Um, and with regard to Department of Water Resources, the staff has provided flow information for a number of projects in response to a request from the Department of Water Resources. Um, and finally, we've been participating on the governor's uh, hydropower working group. Uh, we've been working with various agencies, including the uh, energy agencies, the uh, Public Utilities Commission, the Energy Commission, and also DWR to exchange information and to evaluate how the drought uh, may impact uh, not just flows, but then also hydropower. Um, so looking at the energy-related impacts. So that's it for the FERC and the flow part. Uh, there's been a lot of reference to all of the information, all the things that we're working on. Uh, this has th the usual very long uh, URL for a web page. At this point, it might be good to, if Janine could maybe go to that web page, the easy way for anybody to get information on our drought activities, you just go to the State Water Board homepage and there's a direct link to the drought uh, webpage there. And then there's a number of categories. And can I scroll down with this little thing? No, but if you just briefly scroll down a little bit, if you can, Janine, if I can't do it, it just has a, a, a major heading for each of the areas that we've been discussing today and then goes in many cases to subordinate links that have the more specific detailed information. So as been discussed here, we have information on the temporary urgency change uh, with regard to the delta. We have specific links to other 
transfers and the consolidated place of use that amanda referred to we have a place there for curtailments and as barbara suggested we can add information there as as we get updated information and more specific information so this is the go to place aside from the normal place that we park information for our activities this is the place to go to things for all things drought related and you see including there there's a place to subscribe to drought updates. So if there's interest of the public to get updates to all of these drought related activities, Good. just by going to that, you'll get all of the updates to, to these things. So we Perfect. could spend another half hour looking at all the headings here, but that we can do that afterwards. Um, so you can go back to the uh, PowerPoint, please, Janine. So the, uh, I think, and yeah, so I'd mentioned that where you can subscribe to drought updates, and this would be the time for comments and questions. There's, a, as I'd mentioned, as many have mentioned here, there's a lot of things going on with the drought, even today. So several of our staff will be taking off after this, which will be available if called upon for a specific question. We will have some core staff to respond to questions that you might have as the workshop proceeds. And the same is true for many of the agencies that are gonna be participating panel, particularly the fishery agencies, because there's other drought meetings going on today to figure out what to do. But again, we'll have core staff available throughout the workshop to respond to questions that arise. Terrific, thank you. Any questions? Could you give an example of um, whether you feel comfortable or not on a specific example, like the, on the stand with PG&E, uh, but just an example of how the um, FERC process would work, or not the FERC process, but the process to make adjustments to FERC releases, and also anything that um, you're doing to coordinate, uh, for example, if there's a reservoir where um, a, a utility is requesting an adjustment, uh, could there also be parallel uh, an, another uh, request um, for a change in uh, public trust flows, for example, and you know anything you're doing to coordinate the two uh, potential requests. Sure, those are so. So an example of that, and say for the spring gap, Stanislaw law would happen there, where the, the some of the releases are serving uh, a community. Some of the the project involves a water supply for a municipality. If we're on a trajectory to not have enough water available to meet the needs through the season, well, it suggests that you might need to make a change in flow releases, and that's similar to the request that came in for the, the Sonoma County Water Agency. Does it make sense to continue with the standard in-stream flow requirements that are in large part intended to meet those public trust needs, mm -hmm. but in light of the drought and being off the, the charts in terms of what we would normally expect, does it make sense to have an adjustment? And that can cut, of course, both ways, which is why in real time we're gonna have to be evaluating that. and and. The reality is that all of those things are going to be less than optimal, but to inform any such request, it can't just be, well, you know, we can't make it given normal operations. I think there's going to have to be a demonstration of we've already put in place mandatory uh, conservation. We've done all the things that we think we're able to do, and therefore some relaxation from the standard condition would be appropriate. And then that request would come into us, and we'll be working with FERC to make the, you know, the, the necessary changes. So I'm not sure if that, that answers your question, but we're, we're off the charts in terms of each, but the, the theme here, and I think I've heard it said, so far everybody is stepping up and working together because we're all gonna have to give up everything. You know, There's not gonna be an optimal for any one thing. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just uh, two points, and if you want to elaborate on this, just two points through the course of the um, discussion to, to set the stage. Now I'm gonna forget the second one. But um, the, the first one is, my understanding is in the temporary urgency change orders, you're starting to put in a mandatory conservation provision, which is this, we're all in it together, which is that if someone is asking uh, to cut fish flows, for example, or to shave salinity flow numbers, they're gonna have to show that they have a mandatory conservation program going. Do you wanna talk about that at all? That, that's exactly correct. Fair is fair there. That's exactly correct, and that has bearing on each of the things that you've heard today, but it also has bearing on the temporary urgency change request with regard to the Delta, because we have the trade-off there in terms of um, uh, maintaining salinity for public health and safety, maintaining salinity control in the Delta, 
but opening the Delta Cross Channel gates comes at the expense of the fishery resource. So what's the right mix there? There's going to have we're going to have to really look at things that we haven't looked at in the past because in general we've set the conditions that have do that trade off. But now we have to reevaluate what's the trade off to do with the more limited water supply. No, go ahead. I did remember the second thing, but go ahead if you're talking about this issue. I could provide another example if you would like on that issue of conservation terms. Just let me know. No, go ahead. Okay. So another one that we acted on recently was City of Santa Cruz, and it was a temporary urgency change petition. And one thing we're seeing with these temporary urgency change petitions is they're all different in what they're asking for. Santa Cruz has a release requirement for fisheries. Mm -hmm. And the fisheries agencies, they consulted with the state and federal fisheries agencies, and they were agreeable to a reduction in that release term, so it would be reduced down from one CFS to 0.2 CFS, that would allow the release to happen longer. So yes, there would be less water now, but they would have more water in their reservoir available to make that release longer in time under drought conditions. So sometimes it is kind of a trade-off with these fisheries agencies on what, what they're willing to support. So anyway, with that one, on the conservation term that we work with them on, they have what's called an urban water management plan. And uh, it has different stages in it. And one thing we're finding is each community has different stages and different definitions for those stages. Mm -hmm. But they're about to enter stage three, and that equals some mandatory conservation measures that would be over 20% conservation from existing conditions in terms of water. So the temporary urgency change petition that was signed by Barbara last Friday has that mandatory conservation term within the temporary urgency change petition order. Great. And it, it's it's a <laughs> on that same on that same point that, that oops it's on that same point that uh, I had a question. It's it's my understanding that uh, that there are um, drought plans that kick into place once a, uh, once the governor has declared a drought, and we have in our water rights um, system, I believe, a uh, some specific. Um, areas that people should be uh, should be addressing in, in terms of drought, uh, the uh, reusing and reclaiming water is one of those things. Uh, using water reclaimed by another entity instead of new water, uh, and you know there are about seven or eight of them. Are we checking to make sure that water rights users are actually? doing these things that we require? I think I'll hand that to Jim since he heads the enforcement section. Um, we, yeah, we do. Um, uh, we have an ongoing program for compliance activities where we do review um, those entities that hold the water right, appropriate water right, and whether or not they're complying with their terms. So we will take enforcement uh, if they are not. Um, this, again, this will be for a lot of these activities, uh, for many of these communities, we're getting into new, these are new conservation terms. So um, we certainly will look into scheduling um, and, um, some compliance inspections to make sure that that's happening. Well, that, I, I think one, one thing in the back of my mind, it, certainly the urgency of the moment is the focus of today. But this, I assume, will to some extent pass at some point. And what will we, want to do next to make sure we don't have to go through this again. So um, it's great to have this list of stuff in our, in our water rights um, orders, but if we don't actually check it regularly, people may not be prepared when they actually need it. So I, I'm thinking in those terms. If I may, I think um, that's always one of the challenges. Uh, you know, the term "no good crisis" should go wasted. Um, we, I think, it will be really important to go back and do a retrospective in looking at what was done in previous droughts. Um, we were pulling out dusty files from metal filing cabinets. Uh, of course, a lot of this was not electronically done at that point, and we found, you know, several sets of recommendations that were made after those individual droughts. And looking through it, a lot of those were very very good recommendations, but um, as you know, the populace loses its will often uh, after a crisis has been averted, and so I think that will be one of our challenges is to make a retrospective um, very useful and valuable and make it stick for the future, because I think that's one of the things we've really found in this 
is the challenge of the reporting data, the challenge of the forecasting, the challenge of being able to move quickly and nimbly. Uh, I, it, it's not a system of 2014 that we would all like, and I think we really have lots of room for improvement in order to handle future drought. Great, nicely said. Yes, go ahead. Before, <coughs> before you go on to your second point, you still remember it, right? I do, I do. <laughs> I'm not gonna have one of those. I won't say which governor moments. Oh, no, I was right. a little nervous when I said that. Uh, let me piggyback on the conservation term discussion. I, I think the last time, at least I, I recall that we inserted um, that term, what actually happened was that there was an increase in groundwater usage in that mm -hmm. area. And we heard from uh, the Undersecretary, Undersecretary Burns' comments earlier today with respect to the, the 1970 um, crisis and what happened there in terms of the increase in pumping. So with the addition of the conservation term in these, uh, these orders, what steps are we making, taking to ensure that there is indeed conservation um, and it's not just a shifting of water demand from surface to ground, therefore perhaps creating another problem? I think that's an excellent question, and I, I think we'll get more to that on the 26th workshop when we talk more about water conservation and recycling at that point. Um, but I think that is the logical trade-off in times of emergency is to uh, especially hit the groundwater resources very hard. And whether there's a long-term plan to recoup that loss or whether it's a permanent loss is something that we need to focus on. But how does Mr. Castle intend to enforce the conservation term? That's a good question. <laughs> um, and we, uh, right now, we haven't focused our efforts on that. We've, uh, most of our staff are involved in uh, analyzing uh, potential curtailments. Um, so we'll have to figure that out. Um, we would be basing, we would be reviewing records, I would imagine, on, on past water use and what the current water use is. Great, that's a good segue. The, the, the second point was just something you may have said quickly, but I just wanted to make sure Jim or whoever wants to answer about curtailments because, again, um, those in the water rights world will understand what curtailments are, the general public may not. And it is my understanding that in the curtailments there is an exception for public health and safety so that a whole community's water is not going to be cut off and the general public doesn't need to be uh, frightened that their tap is going to run dry. Do you want to talk about that public health and safety exception? Because my understanding is it will be in the notices you send out. That's correct. Um, we have been evaluating the amount of water that is necessary for health and sa safety needs. And um, we believe that it's prudent, d despite the water right priority system, that if a community has a lower priority right, that they need that water for health and safety needs, that that water should be available to them. And we'd certainly like to hear if there are uh, any um, uh, comments particularly pertaining to the 50 gallons per person per day. We have communicated with the Department of Public Health to, to identify that number. Um, that is not a comfortable number. That, that is a public health and safety number. Uh, some communities and past droughts have, have beat that um, fairly handily. Mm -hmm. uh, others will find that a huge challenge to get down to 50 gallons per person per day. But it's not meant to be a same old, same old number. It's meant to be a this is what is uh, needed for actual public health and safety, not outside irrigation, not um, watering your uh, lawn less, but perhaps not watering. Correct. So it's basically basic sanitation, fire suppression, the like. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. That was very informative and really appreciate all your hard work in addition to that explanation. I know it's been um, relentless. Um, it is now uh, 1020 and I said we would take a half hour break. I'm going to make it a 25 minute break and we will come back at a quarter to 11 with the Department of Water Resources and the Bureau's presentation.